I'm going to be changing a little bit than what we did last year. Last year we just introduced ISIS. It was still new for many people and a lot of people were curious last year. We're going to move beyond that to look at radicalization in Europe. The problem of Islamic radicalization, radicalization or is it a problem? Perhaps it's not a problem. So I want to look at the crisis with ISIS, moving on to what are we doing with radicalization Islamic radicalization. How do we explain ISIS and how do we explain other groups like it? Because there are other groups that, that are popping up as well. Uh, we're finding in uh, Boko Haram has now joined ISIS uh, from Nigeria. Al-Shabaab in Somalia have now joined ISIS. We now know that ISIS is now in Libya. We now know that they have moved to Yemen. They're also in Afghanistan. So these groups are popping up all over the place. Al-Qaeda is one that pre, uh, predated ISIS. So we, we're not just dealing with one group here, we're dealing with a whole slew of groups who seem to be saying the same thing. So we're, we're talking about other groups like the Jamaat Islami, the Tabakli Jamaat, these are other groups that are, have now become, are on our radars. So how do we explain this growth that's going on? Here's a picture of a man that uh, you may know. Uh, this is Jihadi John. This is the fellow that did, did the executions for ISIS. He is from London. He is from Kilburn. He lives about where well, he lived about four miles from where I lived, uh, grew up in London, went to one of the best schools in London, came from a very middle class to upper class Muslim family, uh, was very privileged, had a British educational system, and yet he joined ISIS and did these atrocities. And the question was, why did he do these atrocities? Was he a social misfit? Was he a sexual pervert? Probably, possibly he had anger problems. Maybe he was just poor and disenfranchised. Yet none of these seemed to fit him. And so the question when that we found out who he was disturbed an awful lot of pundits and certainly disturbed an awful lot of politicians. Thomas Evans, who became Abdul Hakim, an Englishman who converted to Islam, who went to join Al-Shabaab in Somalia, he now has been killed. Uh, Taha Asmal from Dewsbury joined ISIS. There is the flag right behind him with the uh, the Shahada and Muhammad's signature in the middle. He is pointing his finger up to God. This is the sign of Tawheed, and he's just about to blow himself up in that car. This is right before he blew himself up there in Iraq. What was he doing in Iraq blowing himself up from Dewsbury in Britain? These are two, the, the two Dawood sisters that took nine children. These came out, went out, were all over the news because these kids were as young as one years old. Why were they taking nine kids? to a combat zone. So these are the questions that we're all coming up with. We're trying to understand why would people who are from Britain, English, brought up as British citizens, what were they doing going and moving and uh, joining ISIS? Well, my president, Obama, said that this group is not Islamic. How many people in this room agree with that? Okay, there's one that agrees with that, all right? Now, when I would ask this question maybe uh, three or four years ago, I would probably get most of your hands. I think now most people are no longer following that dictum. But remember, he's a politician. He has to say that. So I can understand why he would say that. It's not just him. Um, also, our prime minister in Britain, and certainly he says that ISIS is an extreme distortion of the Islamic faith. Um, how many people would agree with that? It's a distortion of the Islamic faith. Okay, well, certainly an awful lot of people that I come in contact with Britain would say that, that that's still uh, the narrative that they're hearing. So who understands Islam best? Many in the East see the problem, but have no freedom to speak about it. We in the West have the freedom to speak, but are blind to the truth. We don't want to speak. We're fearful. We're scared to bring up or say anything about what we know. So what are our church leaders saying? They're saying that we need to find commonality with Islam. Thus, they say that Islam is a religion of peace. Uh, I hear my, our church leaders saying in Britain, I'm sure it's right across Europe, that it not only is Islam a religion of peace, Muhammad was a man of peace. The Quran is a book of peace. Thus, Islam is not Islamic because Islam is a religion of peace. If, if more than that, it's probably a creation of, uh, because of political circumstances. Therefore, it's not our problem. We're not into politics. We separate church and state. So I'm hearing many church leaders kind of walk away from radicalization because it's not the church's problem. Therefore, spend their time working with the moderates and the liberals, people like us, people that we can feel comfortable with, people that we can bring home to tea. Let's bring those kind of Muslims that, are, are, that start from our paradigm and let's only work with them. What about, Mus what about mission leaders here in Europe? Mission leaders, I've, in fact, even here in this conference, I've heard mission leaders say that we must not define Islam, let Muslims define themselves. Islam is whatever my friend next door says. 
Most Muslims I know are moderate, and because most mission leaders do spend only their time with moderate Muslims. Therefore, since they are moderate, thus Islam is a moderate and a liberal organization. ISIS, they say, is a minor aberration and will soon disappear. It's not really going to stay. It, does, it has a shelf life. It's not very important. Therefore, don't worry about it. And what, therefore, their whole premise is to promote moderate Islam and only work with moderate Islam or find commonality with Islam like the C5 insider movement that's coming out of America. So you have different responses coming from with, even within our, our mission leaders organizations, even here at this conference. What about the secular leaders? Now, at least Major General Michael J. Uh, Nagata was honest. And when he said, we have not defeated the idea of ISIS, we do not even understand the idea. At least he was being honest when he said that. And I think that's a problem with many of our military leaders and our politicians. They don't know what they're up against. Militarily, yes, but they don't understand the ideology behind ISIS. They don't understand the motivation behind ISIS. And for one very good reason, they have not read their own material. They have never gone to ask them. They have never spent time with them. And they don't look at where their authority comes from. So why are we so confused? I was in India last year, and, we, and this was, it was fascinating to me because all over India, everywhere I went, there were hundreds, thousands of young men that wanted to learn apologetics and polemics. And they were already engaging with radical Muslims. And I, I was overwhelmed with the passion they had. And I said, why is it you're so passionate to confront and engage with Muslims? And they say, you in Europe have only really had Muslims in Europe for about 40 years. Islam is still new to you. You don't understand it. It's the new men and women on the block. We've had Islam here for 1400 years, from the very beginning, from its very inception. It was here in the very first century of Islam, and we've had to deal with it for 1400 years. We do not fear it like you fear it. You are riddled with colonial guilt. You fear you might hurt their sensibilities. You're so fearful of actually saying anything publicly because you're fearful that you might step on their toes, thus you no longer even share the gospel. You're too fearful to even share the gospel. What an indictment. And I had to sit and I had to listen to my Indian friends and I had said, thank you. Maybe we'll just let you guys fight this battle for us because at least they're, they're engaged. And it's amazing to see what they're doing in India. We don't have time to tell you what's happening there. What about the East? Let's look at some of the opinions of some of the more influential Muslims, men like Ayatollah Khomeini, who no longer is living. He said that all adult males prepare, must prepare themselves for the conquest of the other countries so that Islam is obeyed in every country in the world. Islam wants to conquer the world, whole world. Those who are against war are witless. Islam says, kill all the unbelievers and put them to the sword and scatter their armies. Kill in the service of the arm of Allah, he said. Now, he was being very clear, transparent. He didn't try to hide it. There's no reason why we should not know what they're saying. Amir Tahiri, who's an Iranian author based in Europe, chairman of the Gatestone Institute, said of Islam, whatever good there is exists thanks to the sword. People cannot be made obedient except by the sword. The sword is the key to paradise. There are hundreds of psalms and hadith, he says, urging Muslims to value war and to fight. What about this moderate Islam? Well, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, talk, talking about moderate Islam, says there is no moderate or immoderate Islam. Islam is Islam, and that's it. Our, um, in London, our former mayor, uh, Livingston, Ken Livingston, wanted to find out of a, mo a moderate face of Islam. And so back in 2004, look at the date, July 7th, 2004, he invited what he considered to be the most moderate face of Islam, uh, Dr. Yusuf al Qaradawi, who was on Al Jazeera television every night, and so he's broadcast all over the world, probably the most popular cleric, certainly the most prolific. So he brought him in to show a moderate face of Islam in 2004, July 7th. There at the news conference, and I was watching it live, he was, they, he was asked, what about suicide bombers? Is that legitimate within Islam? And suddenly he just said, well, listen, anytime we are attacked with siege or with military weapons that are stronger or bigger than anything you have, you can use whatever God has given you at your disposal, even your bodies. And then he went on to say, and as far as women are concerned, men, you can beat your wives, and the homosexuals and the adulterers, they must be beaten a hundred lashes. And I remember watching that, and I just started clapping. And I said, you have no idea who you're dealing with. You have never even looked to understand who and where Yusuf Qaradawi comes from. You have no idea what stable he was brought up under. He is a student of Ayman Zawahiri, who is a student of Said Qutb, part of the Muslim Brotherhood. And he was saying what all of them have been saying. This is the same narrative. But look at the date, July 7th. Exactly a year later, to the date, four young men 
came down, blew themselves up in London, killed 52 people. Were they listening to Yusuf Qaradawi, finally giving them permission to use their bodies if they need be? I don't know. It just seems interesting. That exactly a year to that date, those four young men did what they did. Sheikh Omar Bakri Mohammed and Anjam Chowdhury are friends of mine, as much as that may bother you. Both uh, Amr Bakri Muhammad are the ones that have, grown, have created the strongest and fast first, certainly the most popular radical group in Britain. Uh, Sheikh Omar Bakri Muhammad is from Syria. Anjam Chowdhury is British born and bred, and he is now in charge of what used to be called the Al Mahajudin Party. It's now called Islam for UK. It keeps on changing its name because it keeps on being made illegal. And they keep on changing the name, but they keep the same phone number, so you always know who they are. <laughs> Last year, Anjam Chowdhury said, there is no Islam without ruling by that which Allah has revealed, the al Khilafah, and removing obstacles in the way of implementing the Sharia. He went on to say in, on July 21st that Allah is on our side, so we will win. And if Mr. Cameron was on attack against uh, Muslims and extremists, he said he wants Muslims to give up the idea of the Khilafah, Sharia, and Jihad, but we will never give it up, he said. So this is just happening within the last year. Now, there are two voices, and I'm going to give you the two most extreme voices, just to show you what we're talking about in the West. You have Anjum Chowdhury over there on the left, and you have Irshad Manji. Anjum Chowdhury is very much a traditionalist. And Irshad Manji is very much a modernist. Uh, I would say even a liberal Muslim. Both are Western birth, they are both Western schooled, and they are now working freely in the West. And you have this tussle that's going on within Islam. You have a real battle of war, a tug of war. On one side, the traditionists are saying that we need to take Islam and put it back, take it back to that original model there in 1400 years ago, the Rashidun model, that model that Muhammad instigated in 624, that was then taken by Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali up until 661, that 40 year golden period of Islam. That that's what they want to take it back to. That's what they want to bring all of Europe back to. And uh, that's the traditional form. And that's why so much of what we're seeing today is symbolic of what happened in those 40, first 40 years. The modernists, on the other hand, would like to seek the spirit of Islam, try to find and pull out any means of trying to sanitize Islam and make it politically correct, trying to bring it kicking and screaming into the 21st century. So you can see the difficulty with Irshad Manji. She's a lesbian, she is an imam. Uh, she uh, obviously is not invited to many mosques for that very reason. So you can see the difficulty with many of the modernists is they just don't have much of a following, except amongst the liberal and white elitists. They're loved by our press. She gets lots of airtime. She's on our television all the time. Uh, Anjam Chowdhury gets no airtime, but he's loved by the Muslims in the mosques. Now, I've asked many of the modernist Muslims, where, are your, where is your support? for this peaceful Islam. And I've been asking this for 33 years. Can you show me any verse in the Quran? And you can do the ask the same question. Show me any verse in the Quran that states that Muslims are to befriend me, a Christian or a Jew. Ask them that simple question. Is there one verse, just one verse, that says they're to have peace with me, a Christian? Oh, there are peaceful verses in the Quran, yes. Surah 2, Ayah 256 is the best one that they come up with, for there is no compulsion in religion. Lord Ahmed was there in the House of Lords. I was there with, uh, with a group that was trying to stop the Islamic courts. We have 80 Islamic courts now in Britain. They're all legitimate courts. Since 2009, Islamic law has now been brought under British law. And we were trying to stop these courts because of what they're doing to Muslim women. And in comes Lord Ahmed. He sits down at the table and he says, why are we even arguing this? Islam is a religion of peace, for there is no compulsion in religion. So I raised my hand and I said, Lord Ahmed, where is that found in the Quran? He says, I'm not, I don't know, I'm not a theologian. And I said, well, why are you quoting it then? I said, it's found in Surah 2, Ayah 256. Have you read the rest of the verse? Have you read the verse that follows it? Verse 257. Because it's very clear that if you confront Allah or you confront the messenger, great will be your reward in hell. Now tell me if there's no compulsion. But that has nothing to do with me. That's for you, a Muslim. Surah 109, verse 6 says, unto you your religion and unto me my religion. That's the best you're going to get in Islam. That's it. Now, that is a very early verse. It's a Meccan verse. And any good Muslim knows that you have the, what they call the law of abrogation. In Surah 2, Ayah 106, and Surah 16, Ayah 101, I see many of you writing furiously, I speak way too fast. I'll give you the PowerPoint. You can have it. Just give me your, give me your USB and I'll slap it over to you so you can have all of this to see on your own computer. Otherwise, you're going to have a, a sore hand by the end of the hour. 
Now, this verse is very clear that there are contradictions within the Quran. There's about 225 contradictions. Whenever there's a contradiction, you always, always, always go with Nasik. Not Mansuk, but Nasik, the later verse. You always go with the, with the Medinan surahs, the first 20 uh, chapters. Now, this is, that means that Surah Ayah 109 is a very early verse. It is abrogated by 101 verses that come after it. So why don't Muslims tell us that? They usually come up with Surah 2, Ayah 190. Those who fight you do not transgress limits. And I always ask them, what's the rest of the verse? What limits are you not to transgress? Read the rest of the verse and slay them wherever ye catch them and fight them until they prevail faith in Allah. So what are you not to transgress once you've killed us? A little late, don't you think? You, when you look at the entire verse, you can see this is not a peaceful verse. This is anything but peaceful. And of course, the favorite one is Surah 5, Ayah 32. This has been repeated over and over again. I've heard Obama use this. I've heard Cameron use this. I've heard missionary leaders use it, which says, We ordain for the children of Israel that if anyone slew a person, it would be as if he slew the whole people. And if anyone saved a life, it would be as if he saved the life of the whole people. That sounds pretty good. Don't kill, save. I like that. There's a problem. Look who it's to. O oh, children of Israel. This is not for Muslims. This follows verse 31, which is about Cain killing his brother Abel. And it talks, talking about, it's talking about the blood of Abel. It's a redemption analysis on the blood of Abel. If you want to find out what we're to do, read the next verse. Because the next verse says, The recompense of those who wage war against Allah and his messenger, or do mischief in the land. What does that mean? That means if you attack the prophet, if you attack Allah, anytime you do any mischief like that, we are to have our ha killed and crucified, and our hands and feet to be cut off on opposite sides. Now look at the context and see, this is the verse that we're to read. If you confront the prophet and his God, you're going to be crucified and have your hands and feet cut off on opposite ends. Exactly what ISIS is doing. They're following that verse. We've got to make sure that we exegete these verses correctly. And you've got to look at the context. Of all people, we should know that better than anybody else because we do that with our own Bible. Surah 9, Ayah 5. But when the forbidden months are past, then fight and slay those who join other gods with Allah. Wherever ye find them, besiege them, seize them, and lay in wait for them with every kind of ambush. This is known as the sword verse. There's many other verses. Let me just give you a few. Surah 8, Ayah 60. This is the one that ISIS uses all the time. Take steeds of war to strike terror in the hearts of the enemy. They use it over and over again. Surah 4, Ayah 56. Those who reject our signs, we shall soon cast into the fire. As often as their skins are roasted through, we shall change them for fresh skins and let them roast again and again and again and again. This is mainly for the Jews. The context there. Surah 47, I 4. When you encounter the unbelievers, now remember, the first three verses of Surah 47 defines who a believer is and who an unbeliever is. Then verse 4 says, strike off their heads until you have made a great slaughter among them. Can you understand then why ISIS is cutting off our heads? It's not because they have a proclivity for it. It's not because they have an enjoyment of it. It's because scripture tells them to do it. It comes straight out of the Quran, black and white. And the recompense for those, as we said, they shall be killed and crucified and their hands and feet be cut off. And you can see these pictures from ISIS. They're in Aleppo. They're in Raqqa. This is what they're doing, cutting off the heads and the hands and feet from opposite ends. And always the black flag in the background. And as far as apostates are concerned, here are some apostates who are now being executed. That comes straight out of Surah 4, Ayah 89. If they turn back from Islam, take them and kill them wherever ye find them. That has now been stipulated by all four schools of law. The Hanbali, the Hanafi, the Shafi, and the Maliki school. All four stipulate that, taken from Surah 4. What about unbelief? What are they to do with unbelief? Fight them in verse Surah 8, Ayah 39. Until there is no more unbelief, fitna, and the religion will all be for Allah alone. Folks, it's so black and white. You just read scripture. You can see why they're doing what they're doing. What about the Jews and the Christians? You go to Surah 9, Ayah 29. Make war upon those to whom the scriptures have been given until we pay the jizya tax. And that's the sign for Christians. That's the noon sign from Nazarene, which is what we're called in, uh, in the Quran. We are called the Nazarenes after Jesus, the Nazarene. And that's the, the noon sign that depicts who we are. The same sign that Muhammad used in six the 600s, now Abu Bakr Baghdadi is using in the 21st century. As far as recompense, remember there is no assurance of salvation except for these two verses. The only way you can be saved, the only way you have an assurance for salvation, not to be saved, but assurance, is Surah 4, Ayah 74, to him who fighteth in the cause of Allah, soon shall we give him a reward of great value. Those who are killed in the way of Allah, we will admit them to paradise. 
Those two verses is one reason why we have so many suicide bombers. Why so many people are volunteering because they know that they can't work off their salvation. But if they die in the cause of Allah, it doesn't matter what you do, even the day before. The minute before. Like those 19 young men that went to those topless bars the night before. It doesn't matter what you do. As long as you die in the cause of Allah, you go straight to heaven, straight to paradise. Take a look at these verses. How many have seen this before? These are 149 violent verses in the Quran. Why aren't we being told this? Why is it that our missionary leaders are not reading this? Why is it we're not taught this in our schools? We're not taught this because they do not want you to know just how violent that book is. But all my Muslim friends, my radical Muslim friends, know all of these verses. And that's why you've got to listen to where they're going. You've got to see where their authority comes from. You've got to know what motivates them. Now, what about this problem of radicalization? Who has the true... Who are these and where do they get motivated from? Now, there are two schools that are in the West, two schools that are in our churches and also, I think, in our, uh, our academic institutions that stipulate that it's this radicalization that's growing, and we see it's growing, uh, that it's a very new phenomena. That's one school. And there's another school that says it's a very old phenomena. Let's start with the first school that says it's very new. And they would suggest that radicalization, really radical Islam, did not exist prior to 1948. It was inaugurated uh, by the creation of Israel in 1948. It has been exacerbated because of what happened in Afghanistan in 2001 and, of course, in Iraq in 2003. So it has grown because of these political incursions by the West. So really, radical Islam is our fault. We are the ones that created Israel. We are the ones that attacked in Afghanistan. We are the ones that attacked in Iraq and primarily America. So it's a political problem which needs a political solution. And the difficulty with that is... What can the church do in that kind of situation? Ignore it? Fight it? Throw money at it? Find common ground with it? No, it's not our problem, they say. Let the government deal with it. They were the ones that brought this problem on. Let them deal with it. Let's just walk away from it and deal and work with the moderates and the liberals. Now, that's the one school. I don't belong to that school, as you can well tell. I belong to the other school that believes radical Islam has been there from the very beginning. It is the whole root. In fact, radical, the word means root. A root number, a radical number. If you want to find out what radical Islam is, go to the root. Start at the beginning. Go to Muhammad's life. We're going to get to that a little later. But the man you really need to go to is Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah in the 1300s is the one that defined Islam for the modern age. And he said very clearly that to be a good Muslim, read the Quran modeled by Muhammad. The book and the man, the book and the man. That's it. It's as simple as that. Read the book, follow the man. 200 years later, we had another German man who did much the same thing in Germany, who said to be a good Christian, read the book, Sola Scriptura, follow another man, another book and another man, the book of the man. And his name is Martin Luther. And we call that our Reformation. And all of us in this room are, are, are dependent on Martin Luther for what he did then. And we all go back to that paradigm, do we not? So to be a radical Muslim, to be a true Muslim, read the Quran, modeled by Muhammad. To be a true Christian, read the New Testament, modeled by Jesus, right? Does that make you feel uncomfortable? Can you see how similar we are to them? Can you see th we're still looking and asking, when's Islam going to have its reformation? It's already had its reformation. His name was Ibn Taymiyyah. He is the one that had a huge impact on al-Wahhab. Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab, who was there in Arabia, who then studied there in 1700s, there in Medina, Ibn Taymiyyah's material. I'm going back to the Book of the Man, Book of the Man. At the same time, Wahihullah from India had come to Medina and studied there looking at Ibn Taymiyyah's material. <laughs> Wahihullah went back to Patna in India. Al-Wahhab stayed there, and he then amalgamated himself with a family called the Ibn Saud family. The Ibn Saud family then took over all the other tribes and took over the, the Arabian Peninsula created their own country and gave their name to the country. That's why it's called Saudi Arabia today, named after them. The problem was they had political control, but they did not have theological legitimacy. And in order to get that theological legitimacy, they needed someone to come along to give them that, and that's why they brought al-Wahhab, who then created Wahhabism. And that's where Wahhabism comes from, named after him. So that Ibn Saudi Arabia now has, has brought the mosque and state together. And for the last 400 years now, this has now been the teachings that has been coming out with the petrodollars that were discovered in the last century. They are now forcing that Wahhabism all over the world. And we're seeing roots of that in almost every country. All started with one man who followed the model of another man, Ibn Taymiyyah. So folks, this has been around since the 1300s. This is not new, and it was certainly not invented in 1948. Meanwhile, back in India, 
The disciples of Wahihula, who had been teaching Ibn Taymiyyah's material in India, were then confronted by the colonials, the British colonial system, who then pushed many of his Taliban right across North India over into what is today Waziristan, up in the mountains of Western Pakistan, of Pakistan today, amongst the Pashtuns, the most fearless people, never been defeated either by anybody. They are now the, the sanctuary of his teaching, all coming out of Ibn Taymiyyah. Now let's jump to the 20th century. In the last century, two men, these men who you see on the screen, Muhammad Ilyas al Khanlawi, uh, in 1926, there in India, started a group called the Tabikli Jamaat. This is the most, one of the most radical groups in the Indian subcontinent. And they have now, for almost 100 years, been moving out into every country around the world. They're now in 120 countries. They have a membership of 80 million. That's bigger than the entire population of Britain. And yet we're still saying that this is insignificant. These are not important. These don't really matter. In India, where I grew up, I used to go through where this man was first born, where he grew up, uh, Deobandi, Deoband, Abdul Maududi. He was born in India, but then in 1947, when India got its independence and West Pakistan was created, he moved to West Pakistan and started the jamaat e islami which has now grown and grown since the 1940s and has grown so it is now controlling all the madrasas in the northwestern frontier in Waziristan. And this is where they're pouring out Taliban. Hundreds of thousands, 1.7 million Taliban every year are being graduated from these madrasas. 1.7 million. The Taliban became the Taliban. The Taliban then moved into Afghanistan throughout the Russians. Hold it right there and let's go back to Egypt. Because in Egypt, meanwhile, while this was all happening in Egypt, there was a man named Hassan al-Banna who starred the Muslim Brotherhood based on al-Wahhab's teaching. All coming from Ibn Taymiyyah. To be a good Muslim, read the Quran, modeled by Muhammad. And he started the Muslim Brotherhood on those principles. His favorite student was a man named Said Qutb, who had memorized the Quran by the time he was 10 years old, about the size of our New Testament. How many people here could have memorized the New Testament by the time they were 10 years old? I don't see any hands. Can you see the prodigy of what we're up against? These were prodigious young men, little boys. And yet he was the one who was his, the favorite student of Hassan al-Banna. He became so dangerous that Abul Nasser, who was the president at that time, in 1956 had to put him into prison. And for 10 years, from 1956 to 1966, he wrote two books, In the Shade of the Quran and Milestones. What he did is he took what Ibn Taymiyyah had been saying. He took the Quran and verse by verse, surah by surah, he took every verse and applied it to the 20th century which has now become the index, the, the textbooks for all radical Muslims around the world. All my radical friends have read Said Qutb. He was then executed in 1966. He became a martyr for the cause, became, made him even more popular. Now, his favorite student was Ayman Zawahiri, also another Egyptian who had memorized the Quran by the time he was 15. When he got out of prison, he then joined with a man that had an awful lot of money named Osama bin Laden, but didn't know much theology, but was a playboy. And so Ayman Zawahiri then brought the theology and took the money of Omar Osama bin Laden and created what they then called the Al-Qaeda. What does Al-Qaeda mean? It means the base, the root. You go back to the root, you go back to the base. The book of the man, the book of the man, the book of the man. They all go back to the book of the man. It's as easy as that, folks. I'm trying to make it as easy as possible. Now, they were not at all welcomed in Middle East, and so they were invited to come over to Afghanistan. And therefore, in Afghanistan, they started and they set up Al-Qaeda, and then you know what happened in 2001, 9-11, where those 19 young men knocked those two buildings down, the World Trade Center, and attacked the Pentagon. And that's where you all came into the picture, am I correct? Before 2001, how many of you even knew that there was a radical Islam? Probably none of you, or very few of you. It was not on your radar. We didn't know about it. It was really Ayman Zawahiri and Osama bin Laden that woke up the rest of the world. Now their man in, in, in the Middle East was Musab al-Zarqawi. He took their teachings, came back to Syria, befriended a man named Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was, was an intellect, was an academic, had got his PhD at Baghdad University in Islamic studies, both in Islamic history and Islamic theology. He knew his material, but he didn't know how to plan it out on the ground. And that's why Zarqawi trained him up on how to use it on the ground. Sarkawi then was taken out by a U.S. drone, and then Mabul Bakr Baghdadi then created ISIS. So ISIS came out of Al-Qaeda, though it was rooted in Iraq and Syria. Now, let's come back to Britain. We don't want to do too much about Britain. I just want to show you this man right here. This man on the right was a friend of ours. He used to come down to Speaker's Corner. I'm at Speaker's Corner every Sunday. I'll be there next Sunday. You're going to come and join us. We get up on the ladder, and we take on hundreds of Muslims all the, at the time. I've been doing it for 24 years. 
And come anytime you're in London, make sure you're there on a Sunday, come and watch us. You don't have to participate, just be entertained. It's great fun. We have the best time. There are two of my warriors right here, Beth and Sarah. They get on the ladder with me. I can't get guys on the ladder. I can only get women on the ladder with me. Isn't that amazing? And yet we take on these guys, and this man was in our crowd back in 2002. He used to come to the crowd. I didn't really get to know him very well. One of the people on my team got to know him quite well, went to his house, met him. And then suddenly, in 2002, October, he disappeared. And we asked what had happened to him. And we were told that Asaf Hanif was gone to Syria to learn Arabic, a good place to learn Arabic. And then in April 20th, 2003, his picture along with Omar Sharif, not the actor, another Omar Sharif, their two pictures were on the cover of every newspaper there in Britain. I'm sure you saw their pictures as well. The night before, they had been in Israel, in Tel Aviv. They had gone down to Mike's Bar, which is a discotheque right on the ocean, and inside were 200 people dancing. They tried to get into the uh, discotheque. They were stopped at the door. Asaf Hanif pulled the pin on his jacket and blew himself up and killed three Israeli guards right there. Uh, Omar Sharif tried to do the same thing. His bomb was a dud, and so therefore he uh, jumped into the ocean and drowned. Now, fascinating, these two guys we knew, and, I want, and it was, surprised me. I won't tell you what happened after that, but what was fascinating, here was a radical Muslim that I, even in our midst, we didn't know that he had these tendencies. He was as quiet, normal, he was quite a soft-spoken individual, knew his Quran pretty well, and knew my Bible very well. And yet, here he was blowing himself up. And I wanted to know why he was blowing himself up in Tel Aviv, since they were from England. And that next Sunday, I got up on the ladder and I showed their pictures. And I said, I want to talk about these two men. And I sucked all the crowds from every other crowd. And I said, let's talk. I want the Muslims to front, stand front and center. I want to talk to you Muslims. And I said, how many of you would support what these two men did? And about 25 to 30 raised their hands. I said, amongst you who have just raised your hands, how many of you would do what these two men just did last week? And about 15 raised their hand, yelling, takbir. Bismillah, al-Rahman, al-Rahim, alhamdulillah. And as they were yelling out, you could see the horror on the faces of the people who were watching. And I said, look at these men. Memorize their faces. This is not a faceless enemy in Afghanistan or Iraq. We've got a problem right here. These guys are willing to blow themselves up for their God. What are you going to do about it? Now, that was in 2003. We know what happened two years later. Four young men came and did just that. They weren't these men. They weren't probably, those four men were not in the crowd that day. I could probably do it this next Sunday and we would get the same response. We do know that Jihadi John did come from London, that he was born and grew up there. We're now having a real problem with those who are leaving. We've had about 2,000 that have left Britain alone. Siddhartha Dad, I'll talk a little bit more about him later. We have the Al Qansa Brigade. There's an entire brigade in Raqqa of women who do the policing of other women. They're all made up of Londoners. They're all, they only speak English, they don't speak Arabic called the Al-Qansa, the brigade, and they walk around with AK-47s, only their eyes are showing. These are three of them on their way there. They're picture, pictured in Turkey before they cross the border. Now there's this new arrival, what we call wolf jihadis. Taha Sabi Falaha said this in September 2014, that they are to kill any disbelieving American or European, French, Australian, Canadian, including the citizens of the countries, kill them in any manner or way, and he was, uh, he was a spokesman for ISIS when he did this. And we're starting to see this happen. For those of you who are in England, we know about Michael Adibalajo. Here is a young Nigerian Pentecostal Christian who was converted to Islam in 2003. In the next 10 years, he then became a disciple of Anjum Chao. You can see him just behind Anjum Chao, the shoulder there. There he is demonstrating down here. And in a 10-year period, he became radicalized. He then, there in 2013, he then wanted to find a British soldier, found drummer Rigby, hit him with the car, jumped out, and then he tried to cut off his head. And then he stayed around for 16 minutes, didn't even run away, waiting for the police to come. And then when the police came, he rushed them, and was hoping to be killed to be a shahid, but he wasn't. So at his, he gave a piece of paper to some, one person in the crowd, and they read that paper at his trial a year and a half ago. Guess what was on that paper? It was, a, it was basically a letter to his son explaining why he was doing what he was doing. And he just referred to verse after verse after verse in the Quran, just quoting the Quran. So what was his motivation? Just read those verses. The book and the man, the book and the man. Just go back to the book. But how many of us are going back to that book? How many of us even know what these verses say? How many of us are being taught this? Not in our Bible schools, not in our seminary. How many of your government officials even knew the verses he was quoting? But can you see what Islam has done within a 10-year period to a Pentecostal Bible-believing Nigerian young boy? In 10 years, he became a peace-loving Christian to a jihadi Muslim. Now, some of you may have seen the news just last week. 
He was taken out of Belmarsh Prison because he has radicalized so many other young men in Belmarsh Prison in London. He's now been moved up to the north because of his influence just in one prison. So he's still radicalizing. And everything he does, he goes right back to the Quran, modeled by Muhammad. Charlie Hebdo shootings. When uh, uh, Al-Qaeda wrote out their memoir as to why they were shot, look at the verses they use. Surah 33, Ayah 57, Verily those who annoy Allah and His Messenger, Allah has cursed them and has prepared for them a humiliating torment. A curse they shall be seized wherever they found and killed with a terrible slaughter. They wrote that. We didn't write this. This was why they did what they did. We didn't have to write it. They just quoted the Quran. But how many of your newspapers read or even published that story? The 21 Coptic Christians that were killed by ISIS just last year in February. As they were dying, please don't look at the video. I have to look at them because my radical friends, we talk about it. But don't you look at the video. As you're watching the video, you can see them praising Jesus' name, calling out to Jesus as they were dying. Just brought tears to my eyes. What a testimony as they were dying. The Paris atrocities that just happened last November, very close to home. How many of you knew why they did what they did? The two days after that happened, that happened on a Friday, we went up on a Sunday, got up on the ladder. You can go see it. Go look at it. It's up on our website. It's up on our YouTube site. Fander Films. Just go up on the Fander Films. Hatun and I are on the ladder together. We had just, this is just two days after that atrocity. We asked the crowd, none of you believe that this was Islamic. Therefore, who did this? If these weren't Muslims, then what was their motivation? And why did they attack the sports hall? Why did they attack the restaurant? Why did they attack the uh, drinking hall? And why did they attack the music, music hall? Why did they attack those four venues? Do you know the reason? They told us yesterday. They told us on Saturday. The very next day, ISIS put out, they put out a manifesto saying exactly why they did it. And they quoted two verses, Surah 59, Ayah 2. It is against any al-Kitab, that is against Christians and Jews. And Surah 63, Ayah 8, against any hypocrites, anybody who, uh, who works in any one of these vices. Anyone who works in a sports venue, an eating venue, a drinking venue, or a music venue. <coughs> They're transparent, but how many of you know that? How many have, have you know that, how many of your newspapers printed that? No, they don't want you to know this. See, your government and your media does not want you to know that almost every time ISIS does an atrocity, they back it up with scripture. They quote verse after verse after verse. The San Bernardino shootings, Said Rizwan Farouk and Tashfin Malik, December 2. We couldn't figure out why they had done this, and then we found out that they were members of the Tabigli Jamaat, influenced by one of the most radical groups in the Indian subcontinent. Abu Ramaisa, his name used to be Siddhar Tadar. We're good friends with him. One of the men on our team actually used to meet with him and have big discussions with him. He then, uh, the week before he left, he was even in a discussion with him and his radical viewpoints that, from a Hindu to a Muslim. He then said, you know, with the way you believe, it seems it's odd, it's odd that you haven't joined ISIS. And the very next week he went and joined ISIS. There he is, pictured there with his new baby there in Raqqa. And then we just heard just now, just two months ago, he then executed those five men. He's the new Jihadi John. We know him personally. He's from London. He's one of us. Used to be a Hindu. See, this is very close to home for us. And that's why we cannot dismiss it as something that's an aberration. This is affecting too many of us all the time. Now, let's move on. So how pervasive is radical Islam? We're hearing over again, in fact, even, even here in the last two days, that it's just a small minority, maybe just 1%. It has very little control. It's an aberration, we're hearing, that most Muslim clerics reject it. We just heard that today. And that all Western pundits reject it. It doesn't really, it doesn't really represent Islam. My president said that 99.9% .9 of Muslims are peaceful. Well, they wanted to find that out in Britain. And so right after the atrocities there in 9-11, they did a survey and they found that in 2001, 15% of Muslims in 2001 were, fifth, uh, were radical, 70% were nominal, another 15 were liberal. When they asked the same question a year later, the radical number had grown to 25% when they did another survey in 2006. So five years later, the group that had been 15% had now grown to over 40% and that 20% of them supported suicide bombings. Since in February of 2015, 27% of British Muslims supported the Charlie Hebdo killers. Can you see how it's growing even in our own countries here in Europe? This is Britain we're talking about. So is this 1% that we're hearing from our politicians? That's not 1%, folks. We're almost, almost as up as high as 50%. 
Pew International wanted to find out what, what would be the case around the world. So they went to four countries, Turkey, Morocco, Jordan, and Pakistan, to see to represent four different uh, positions of the world. And they found that in Turkey, 31% supported radical Islam. In Morocco, it's 45%. Jordan, 55%. Pakistan, most troubly, 65%. This is in 2004, when there were, uh, there were 140 million Muslims. That's 80 million Muslims. Now we're in 2016, how, much of, how, much, how many more have now grown there in Pakistan? We hear that 99% of Muslims are peaceful, that they are fed up with being targeted as radicals. Yet up 2,000 approximately have left the UK to join ISIS. We only have 450 Muslims in our military. What does that tell you? Since 2006, another 2,000 have been arrested. That's above the 2,000 that have already left to join ISIS. Another 2,000 have been arrested. And the ones that have been arrested, only 230 have been tipped off by Muslims, which makes only 10%. The other 90% have been tipped off by police or social workers, which means there's probably a few other thousand that we're not getting because the people that are closest to them, the very people who could tip us, tip the police off, are refusing to do so, especially since December of last year, where every imam has now said that they will not support the only institution that, is that has been uh, created in Britain to find and de-radicalize young youth called PREVENT. So let's look at the numbers. Let's see if this is just 1%. The Clarion Project just came out with these findings last year, just a few months ago. If there's 99% of the Muslims in the West claim to be peaceful, and there's about 1.6 to 1.8 billion Muslims in the world, Yet we know that 40,000 to 200,000, 40, to 200,000, the number of the members are within ISIS, that Hamas has 30,000, Hezbollah has 50,000, Al-Qaeda has 100,000, and there's anywhere from 20 to 100,000 amongst the Iranian guards. Is that 1%? What about some of the agendas of the radicals, like apostasy? That would be a pretty radical agenda, that, that anybody that leaves Islam should be executed. When they asked that question around the world, they found that 79% in Afghanistan believed that apostates should be killed. 86% in Egypt believed apostates should be killed. 82% in Jordan, 76% in Pakistan, 62% in Malaysia, 20%, 27% of all Muslims believe that apostates from Islam should be killed. That's a total of 230 million, 7 million of all Muslims believe apostates from Islam should be killed. Is that 1%? What about honor killings? 37% of all Muslims believe that those who dishonor a family should be killed. That makes a total of 345 millions. That's 1%? Suicide bombings. Here in Britain, I'm sorry, here in Europe, amongst French Muslims who answered the survey, 42% of them under the age of 29 believe that suicide bombings are justified. In Britain, it's 35% of those under the age of 29. In my country, in America, it's 26% of those under the age of 25 believe that suicide bombings are justified. That's 1%? Sharia, or Hadood laws. And this is probably the most prolific part of, of radicalization because Islamic laws with their punitive laws, the Hudud laws, are something, is a good rubric to know what, who is radical and who is not. When they asked the question in the West, they found that 53% of Muslims in the West believed and wanted to, and favored Sharia law being brought in. 52% in the West believed in whippings and amputations. 51% of all Muslims in the West are in favor of stoning adulterers. Around the world, it comes to 281 million Muslims now believe that in the Sharia law, using whippings, amputations, and stoning, that's 1%? Where is this 1% coming from? <coughs> and why this growth? Well, I think we need to go back. We've already said you need to go to the two sources, the Book of the Man, the Book of the Man. We've already gone to the book. You've seen enormous amount of support for it in the Quran. When you look, about, when you look at the Prophet's own example, when you look at his, uh, his life, just take a look and see what he did, and you will see. If you look at his biography, look and see what he did between 624 and 632, the last eight years of his life. He was involved in 29 battles and planned another 39 on top of that. Look and see what he did to the Jews, the Banu Kainuka family, the Banu Nadir family, the Banu Quraiza family, the only Jews left in Medina when he moved there. Within three years after 624, he had either taken them as prisoners, had taken them for concubines for his wife, and the last remaining 800 men of the Banu Quraiza family in 627, he took them out out into the desert, and he cut their throats in one afternoon. Slit their throats in one afternoon. This the man of peace? <coughs> Those who criticize him. 
Asma bin Marwan, who was a poetess, when he moved to Medina in 622, she wrote poetic verse against him. He said, who's going to take care of this woman for me? Umar, one of his disciples, went that night. As she was suckling her baby, he plunged a knife through her heart, came back the next morning, told Muhammad what he had done. Muhammad turned towards her and said, great, towards him, and said, great are you for supporting your prophet. This the man of peace? With this kind of scripture references and this kind of model that we have, that book and that man, can you then understand why ISIS is what it is? Now, I've already done this before. We did this last year, so I'm going to zip through these slides. They're just for you to look at, just to remind yourself what we said last year. Remember, in 2014, in June, they came with 800 men using Surah 8, Ayah 60, about the steeds of war. And they had those two blitzkriegs right down through the two major rivers, coming down through Talafar, Mosul, Kirkut, not Kirkut, sorry, uh, uh, Tikrit and Baiji. They took over those cities one after another, hardly anybody to stop them. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was their leader. He was the one that has, was studied under Zarqawi. He got his doctoral thesis. And then in, uh, in July of 2014, he took off his battle dress and put on religious dress and did the khutbah there at the Mosul Mosque. Once he had done that, he was then bringing the mosque and state together, creating the Khilafat. And that's when the Khilafat began in July of 2014, by bringing the two together. He took off the last two letters. No longer was it Islamic State of Iraq and Al-Sham. Now it's just Islamic State, IS. And that's what they have done since 2014. And then from there, they started pulling in hundreds of thousands, mostly from North Africa, others from Europe, from all over the world. They start pulling them to come and join them there in Syria. Just take a look at the numbers. You can look at this later. They're coming from Indonesia. They're coming from Australia, Chechen, American, German, Austrian, all over Europe. Foreign girls, many of them coming from Britain, the al Qansa Brigade that's contracted uh, those from London. Their attraction, successful internet propaganda for the women, the masculine men, for the men, an exciting testosterone-filled life. For many of the Muslims, a way to closely follow what Muhammad and, uh, Muhammad and the Quran, and to return back to that Rashidun period, that first 40 years, that golden period of Islam. The aims that they want to do, according to I-60, is they want to take Islam, the world back to the seventh century. They want to bring back these states again. This is what Islam was like. Uh, during the time of the Rashidun, and they want to bring it back, and that's their map. That's not my map. That's the map they sent out for, to, for the world to warn the world what they're going to do. After they did the, uh, they came down to the, they then went into the cities and they took out the men, and then what they did is they brought them out and then they started executing them just as Muhammad had done with the Banu Qurayza family. Filming everything they did, they always put the flag in the background so that Muslims could see that they were following what Muhammad did in 627. They were doing in 2014. What was their their Quranic support, they always write their Quranic support. Surah 2, 9, Ayah 123. Fight those of the unbelievers who are near to you and let them find in you hardness. Slay them wherever ye find them. Drive them out of the places where they drove you out. They went to Mosul, which is a Christian town. Put the sign of noon on all the doors and the gates. And then they gave them three options, either to convert, to pay the jizya tax, or to die. All the Christians did a fourth option. They fled so that there are no very few Christians left in Mosul today. And then they went, and the Hadith support from that is Sahih Muslim, Book 19, which goes through and delineates exactly how the, the Jizya tax is to be allocated. They went into the churches, took down the crosses, put up the flag. They went into the Bar Benha Monastery, a fourth century monastery, and they went and destroyed the oldest Chaldean biblical manuscripts in, from the 17th century, and yet no one complained. No one complained. BBC only ran one paragraph about it. None of us complained that those are our oldest Chaldean manuscripts. The support, Surah 5, Ayah 51, take not Jews and Christians for friends. Sahih Muslim, Book 19, I will expel the Jews and Christians from the Arabian Peninsula and will not leave any but Muslims. And then they started doing the crucifixion, the beheadings. I've already gone through these verses, Surah 5, 33, Surah 47, Ayah 4. I don't even have to make them up. ISIS puts it in their magazines. They're right up there in the big magazine. You can read them for yourself. Sport for killing unbelievers comes out of Sahih Muslim. 4661. Then they start zeroing in on the Yazidis. The Yazidis are not Islamic. They're not uh, Christian or Jews. They're pagans. They're pre-Islamic. Zoroastrians. And so they start enslaving the Yazidi women. I'm sorry, they're not Zoroastrians. I, I stand corrected on that. The support for that, Surah 4, Ayah 24. Sur, versus uh, Surah, Surah 23, Ayah 6. Surah 24, Ayah 34. Surah 70, Ayah 30. Surah 33, Ayah 50. There's verse after verse after verse in the Quran that allows them slavery. <coughs> Now, finally, U.S. started getting involved, and as soon as we got involved, they started executing our men. Support for that, Surah 47, Ayah 4. 
They even started killing other Muslims, like those who had converted, like Peter Kass said. I won't go into this. We did this last year, so you know what happened. But you can see what they did. The legitimacy for that, Surah 9, Ayah 73, Surah 9, Ayah 123. In the place of Dabiq, the reason they use Dabiq, because this is where the final battle is going to be fought, according to Sahih Muslim 69224, against the Romans, against Constantinople. Now, who are, would be the equivalent of the Romans today, the Byzantine Empire today? We would be the equivalent of that. So that's why they want us to go to Dabiq. That little place just north of Aleppo, very close to the Turkish border, has no uh, military strategic significance, but it has huge prophetic significance because this is the end of the apocalypse. This is the apocalyptic dream that ISIS has. You've got to read their material to understand that. And of course, in 2015, the Charlie Hebdo shootings, there's the scripture of support for that. And then back in 2015, Kenji Goto, an evangelical Christian, uh, who was then killed, uh, along with Moat al Kasaba uh, a few weeks later. The 21 Coptic Christians in 2015. Abu Rumaisa, who's now continued that in 2016. He just executed these young men just a few months ago. Then they started destroying any structural, uh, secular institutions that stood against Islam, with the Mosul Museum. You also saw what they did in the Nimrud artifacts. You also see what they did in Palmyra. City after city. So the question we need to ask is, who can confront them? Most people would say, well, this is the state, the state can confront them, and they are doing a pretty good job. And they may defeat them on the ground. They may defeat them militarily. The problem is, can they defeat them ideologically? Can the state take on the ideology which motivates them? It dare not, because it only knows one thing, and that is to use bombs, bullets, and cruise missiles. You cannot defeat an ideology using bombs, bullets, and cruise missiles. <coughs> Even if you did defeat ISIS, another would pop up to, to take its place. There would be group after group because they're all going back to the same book and the same mat. So who can confront them? What about the atheists? They're trying to, they're best. Tom Holland, historian. Anne-Marie Walters, a friend there in Britain. Douglas Murray, one of the best we have in Britain, doing a great job debating them in public. The difficulty with people like him and Garrett Withers is they have no solution. They have no antidote. They have nothing to offer them. The humanists have tried to, but they are just full of rage, full of defiance, and they have, are just incapacitated by fear. The Muslim missionaries is fascinating. You would think they would take them on, but the Muslim missionaries that we're meeting are all targeting Britain. They're all targeting Christians. They're trying, they're all interested in converting Christians. And they are replete on the internet sites. And they're putting out tract after tract. They never target radical Islam. I've never seen any Muslim missionary even take it on. In fact, if anything, in private, they would probably support it, ISIS and the others. They only are interested in targeting us. So how have, them, how have the moderate Muslims responded, the people that most missionaries would like to work with? The Princeton scholar Bernard Haeckel says this, a leading expert on the group's theology says that the moderate Muslims are embarrassed and politically correct with a cotton candy view of their own religion that neglects what the religion has historically and legally required. Many denials of the Islamic State's religious nature, he said, are rooted in an interfaith Christian nonsense tradition which most of us are involved in. It's mostly Christians who are creating these interfaith dialogues. When they did a survey just this year, I'm sorry, in 2013, they wanted to find out what nominal Christians versus nominal Muslims in Europe were like. And they found that of those who want to return to the roots, only 20% of Christians want to return to the roots, 58 Muslims want to return to the roots. Those who thought that there was only one true binding religion, 18% of Christians, 74% of Muslims. Religious rules, more important than secular laws, 12% for Christians, 65% for Muslims. Those who agree with all three of this, only 3% of those who are Christians responded versus 50% of all Muslims. So even the nominal Muslims are more radical than we are. So how, how have we responded? Most of us have just hid from the truth. Fearful, want only friendship. We do not want to publicly engage. There is a fear of publicly engaging. So who has a solution for radical Islam theology? I would say radical Christianity. We're the only ones that can really take on radical Islam. And there are some who are doing it. I'm doing it in the in United Cade, along with Dr. Patrick Sokdale, Sam Solomon, David Wood, Sam Shamoon in Chicago, David Wood in New York, Dr. James White in Phoenix, Tony Costa in Toronto, Nabil Koresh in Oxford, Mary Jo White in Dallas, Samuel Green in Australia, and of course, our three lionesses in London. 
Beth Grove, who is probably one of our best speakers, she is now on the corner, up on the ladder. She's on the internet. She's doing debates <coughs> on Trinity channels. You can see her all over the internet. Hatun Tosh is probably our most courageous evangelist I've ever met. Uh, this woman has brought 125 Muslims to the Lord in just one year, <coughs> including three imams in just one year. And she does exactly what Paul does. She goes right into mosque after mosque after mosque. As Paul went to the synagogue, she says, if Paul does it, why can't I do it? And then Sarah Foster, who is sitting right there, is one of our best researchers. We now have her up on the ladder. She's doing some amazing research on us, for us, especially on slavery in Islam. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. Folks, why, are we, why is it that we can engage better than anybody else? Because we are the only ones that have the solution, and I'm going to give the solution tomorrow. I'm going to get you all depressed today. <laughs> Come back tomorrow, and we're going to show you how we can destroy Islam. And I'm going to do it in one hour, showing you what we have that can absolutely decimate them historically, using the most neutral material we have. And uh, we're going to look at that. We're going to show you what, how the refugee crisis is coming and how we need to use pastoral situations to engage with them. Uh, I'll, I don't have time to talk about her, but we need to go public, folks, and we need to bring Jesus into every situation. Now, for those of you who want to know how to do this, we do have one thing that we say to all the time, and that is we use arguments and take captive every thought and make it obedient to Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 to 5. Are you ready? If you are ready, come and see my two colleagues here because we now have a whole program that we can come and bring it to you that we are now teaching in London, but that we are sending overseas by internet every Wednesday night. We're in 14 countries right now, 85 students. We can come to every one of your countries and we can teach you 42 different lessons over a period from September to July of how to engage with Islam. How to engage not only with the radical Muslims, but the moderate and the liberal ones as well. Show you not only what they believe, but also take on all their questions and how to answer them in a two minute soundbite and also how to answer them by feeding the gospel into every question. 